there's no place that I'd rather be than, than right here thinking about these things with you. It, it would sweeten the pie, pie if my wife was here with me, but, but, to, but to think together strategically how do we mobilize our churches to be able to wisely love one another, to, to care for one another. There's no place I would rather be than right here thinking about these things with you. And that's what I'd like to do. I'd like to invite you to, to think as actively as you can with me. This is a time where you're considering your particular church, and wherever we are in our local churches, we want people to be even further mobilized in the way they care for each other. When, when the gospel breaks in, there, there were some things that really were not anticipated. For example, I don't, think, I, don't, I don't think we anticipated singleness as being as prominent and, and as fine thing as it is. Everything changes when, when Christ comes. I don't think we would have anticipated that, that suffering and in, in, in shame are, are now, in a certain sense, badges of honor. And I don't think we would have anticipated that, that, that no longer would ministry simply reside in the hands of the, of the priests and occasionally the prophets, but, but all people would be the ones doing ministry. Ephesians 4.12 is the passage I have in the back of my mind. It's, what do we do? It's, you are called, leaders in your church are called to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. And certainly an essential part of that ministry is how do we care for one another? How do we pastorally care for one another? That's what I'd like you to be as active as you can on for the next 40 minutes as I give you some, some thoughts, uh, hopefully just really basic ingredients of, of what, you're, what you're expecting to see within, within your own churches. So what is your strategy for, for pastoral care? Let me, let me lay a foundation, I think we could all agree on this, that, that what we want within our congregations are, are people who, who are needy, desperate even, who, who are dependent on Christ by faith and, and are, are willing to say help to the Lord, but even more, they're... they're they have a track record of having said help to one another. I, as I look at my own life, I, I find that, that every day consists of saying help to the Lord. But, but it is still so hard for me in the small group or in the context of the larger church at home to, to ask for prayer from the other brothers and sisters. It's, it's embarrassing. I hope in another year or two I won't be saying those things. But... But this very foundation of ministry, that we are needy people, is, is one of the hardest things to do. We, we live in, a, in an environment in the church where the Lord is determined that he would actually use people to, to do his work of ministry. The Spirit and the Word oftentimes working through other people. And, and those people are people who struggle with sin and struggle in their own sufferings. And they're willing to speak about it with, with each other. Consider, consider your own life and, and in, in ways that other people have influenced you. I'm sure there have been lots of good sermons that you've heard, but, but I am suspecting, I'm suspecting you could probably remember those who, who simply were needy and asked for prayer as, as being these, these, these glorious reflections of Christ to you. So as you think of how do we mobilize the church for mutual ministry, one of the things you're doing is, is how can we have a family of God that is open with each other and needy before God and before each other. In your own sermons, in your own preaching, how do you do such a thing? 
I can remember the, 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 the pastor who has probably had the most influence in my own life. The first sermon I heard, he, he happened to mention he was a sinner. And there was, I'd never heard such a thing. In all the sermons that I'd heard prior to that time, I'd never heard a pastor confess that, that he was a sinner. And the, the sin he confessed, frankly, it, it, it was a relatively small thing. Uh, it, he didn't listen to his wife very well. And it was one of those sins where when he confessed them, people would laugh because, because they, they were so familiar with that particular sin. It wasn't the kind of sin where people would, would, would gasp, but, but, that, but that small, simple statement. And then asking the congregation to pray for him, it, it transformed our body. And all of a sudden, it was as if people recognized, oh, this is a place where we're able to speak openly, where we don't have to somehow seem, seem relatively perfect to each other. The first thing that you want to do in your ministry with each other is, is how can we grow in, in neediness and humility with our sins and with our sufferings? With our sins, I think of Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 is is essentially inviting us to look at all these sins out there and say, aren't they so bad? And then in sort of an Isaiah kind of strategy, Paul whips around in Romans 2 and says, and you, and you. Neediness that comes from knowing our own sin. Have, have we asked others to pray for us in our own battles with sin? 2 Corinthians 12. Neediness in, in the midst of our own weakness just because of the, the, the very struggles of life. How, how are you going to lead your church in being especially needy? How are you going to be asking for, for their help? It just so happens that as, as we consider ministering to one another, it, that, that act of humility, it, it builds up the body, it encourages the body, it, it also protects the body as they minister to one another. For example, isn't it true that, that people who are struggling, who have asked for help in our churches, they have, they have typically heard well-intentioned but really horrifying things. Just pray, just do this, just do that, as if their suffering is, can be solved with, with some simple remedy. We, 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 we've said things that have been hurtful, and all of us have received things that are hurtful. And, and typically, it, it's, it comes out of a certain self-confidence that, oh, I know that particular issue, and we have a particular scripture, and we're able to bring it to bear in a person's life, and then we move off and consult with somebody else. Could you imagine humility and neediness and how, how it, it, we have a confidence in Christ, but, but we no longer have a confidence in ourselves? And... And there's a sense of how can, how can we turn to Christ for this? That kind of humility, it, it brings a kind of camaraderie in the pastoral care that takes place in your own church. So this is prerequisite. What are the, what are the prerequisites? What are the, what are the things you're looking for in those who minister to one another? You're looking for humility. You're looking for people who were willing to, to ask for prayer from the brothers and sisters in, in the body. And, and they will not do it unless you are doing it yourself. How, how can you advertise that particular culture? Now, I just want to identify a few different things this afternoon. And we could stop at any one of them and, and say, as is, is we grow in this, then our churches will, will deepen and broaden in the way we do pastoral care. Uh, and, and we could stop right here and say, this is enough. For us to consider how, here, here's, my, here's my goal. I'm going to go and I'm going to ask my, my children to pray for me. I'm going to ask my spouse to pray for me. I'm going to ask my elders to pray for me. And this is what I'm going to ask for prayer for. And these are the promises of God. I want them to pray in my own life. If that's... If that's the only thing we do here, it, it will be transformative in your church. It will 
it, it will communicate that this is a place where we are open before God and before each other. Yet from that platform, there's more we can say. And I think we'd probably agree that, that the, the essence of, of, of personal ministry, face-to-face -face ministry, is, is essentially knowing a person and... I was going to say knowing what God says, but let's put it a little bit differently. Knowing a person and praying for them. Knowing a person and praying for them. And, 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 and I, want to put, I want to say praying for them because it, it, it's another kind of protection. Because, it, because if we're knowing God and knowing people, those are the two features of ministry. But if knowing God is couched in how can we turn to the God who hears? It's, it, 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 it assures that our care for another is going to point them to the personal God rather than somehow rest in, oh, if you do this particular principle from Scripture, you do these things right, then things will go better. To know a person and, and to pray for them, to, to pray with them. Those, that's what you want everyone in your church to be able to do with each other. But, so that, that's the essence of it, but, but let me put some bookends around it. Because you, you really can't know someone unless you, you actually pursue other people, unless you move toward other people. So let, let me just take a second and, and consider that. If, if we are growing in humility, in an overt of public humility and neediness, it will, it will affect the dynamic and the pastoral care that's taking place among the laity in our church. If, if we remember that we have a God, I guess it's the definition of grace, He's the God who pursues us. And, and out of the knowledge that we have been pursued, we, we take the initiative toward other people. Could you imagine what it would be like in your church to to see no person alone after a service, for, for every person to have been pursued by another and, and engaged in some sort of meaningful knowing and perhaps meaningful prayer. So, so in order to know one another, we actually have to move toward each other. And, and here again, if, if this is the only thing we were going to talk about this afternoon, it would it would change our churches. It would be, it would be part of, of that growth that we have prayed for in our own churches. I, one, of, one, of the, one of the finer moments in my own church was a, a man in a, in a small group with me, and we were talking about these kinds of things. And he's a, he's a man who, who, who natively is, is really very shy, and it's, it's very difficult for him to engage in conversations. And... And there was a person sitting next to me. And at our church, we usually have a five or ten minute break as the kids go out and we have an opportunity to, to, to meet the, the ones who, who were nearby. And so it was a new person who was nearby. And I went to turn to, to speak with, with, with the couple. And, and this, this young man who was in our group, who, who, who you know, those five or ten minutes tend to be the most painful time in his life. He, he, he just ran. He made this beeline over to this other couple and got there before I was there. It was, I felt like taking my shoes off because it was holy ground. I was watching the Spirit, I was, I was watching the Spirit empower a man to, to do very powerful ministry. If, if you've ever been to a church and, and haven't known anyone and, and someone has pursued you, Someone has taken the initiative toward you, and, and somehow they've been all in. They've been, they haven't been distracted, but they've been all in in whatever conversation they have. It, it changes you in, in some small way. How can we be a people who, who don't, don't wait for somebody to come and ask us for help, but we, we pursue? Now here's, the, here's the challenge. It, it's one thing to pursue, it's another thing to, 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 to make those initial steps of conversation where we're knowing another person. Some of those initial steps, they're, they're relatively straightforward. Hi, I'm Ed. What's your name? You know, how, did, how is it that you end up coming here? 
uh, maybe something about their work, something about their living situation, they're living by themselves, with roommates, with family. But, but after those, those kind of formalities, sometimes it can be a, a little bit of a stumper to, to know someone a little bit better. So, so as, as we seek to mobilize our church to care for one another, I guess you know, it, it's going to be essential that there's this growing understanding about how do we actually know someone. So you know, think about this. How, in, in your own preaching, in your own teaching, how, what do you, how are you preaching in such a way that it guides people in being able to have deeper relationships with each other? Maybe it goes something like this. I want to know you. And, and Scripture oftentimes will talk about the heart. I want to know, I want to, I want to know the things that are on your heart. And the way Scripture identifies that is there's, it, what I, there's more to you than what meets the eye. You know, the heart, it talks about these, these roots that go down into, in, in, into, this, into this stream. You don't, you don't see where they go, but that's where all the action is. Deep wells, there's, there's more going on than we realize. There's a certain depth to another person that invites us to go further in and further in. How do we do such a thing? I was going to church one day, and, and frankly, I was a little bit late, and there was a friend of mine who, who simply said, Ed, how are you? And, 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 and I assume that, that, that here, as in Philadelphia, there are, there are different ways of saying, how are you? One way is, is how are you? It's a greeting, and it, it's basically a greeting that says, I don't really care how you are, I, I, but, I, but hi. And the, the appropriate response is, how are you? Now, in Philadelphia, there's a way of doing it. You have to sort of, how are you? How are you? It's, you have to sort of mumble it. And, and he wasn't mumbling it. He, was, he actually said, how are you? You ever had somebody ask you that question? I suspect you have. But you realize there are people in your church who have never had that particular question asked of them? A, a, a family member, friends have never asked that particular question, how are you? And, 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 and I, I thought it was just a, hey, how are you? And I was walking away and he grabbed me. And he said, no, I, I want to know the best thing from your week. I want to know the worst thing from your week. And you're not going to get up until you tell me. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it true that, that the, Lord, the Lord has chosen in, in his church to, to use ordinary people to do the heavy lifting of, of ministry? And, and isn't it true in the most ordinary things a, a friend who says, I want to know the best of, of your week, I want, to know the, I want to know the worst of your week. In a question like that, people have changed. All of a sudden, what's going to happen? I am going to ask those questions of somebody else now. I'm going to, I'm going to pass it on. And, and also, here's a person I recognize is ac actually cares. And when I am going to risk I'm struggling, could, could, I need somebody to pray for me. He's the person I'm going to call. Can you see this, 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 this networking in the body of Christ taking place? Simply, how are you? Essentially, what's most important? What's, what are the best things? What are, what are the worst things? Now, now there's, there's a certain theology behind everything we're saying, and, and, and the theology here was essentially, what is the theology of the heart? And, and very briefly, I would suggest that the heart is, it is organized around desire, affection, the things that we love. And, and you can almost hear throughout the Psalms the Lord inviting us to speak from our heart. We're, we're, at, the, we're at, the, at the kingdom dinner table, and what are the best of things? What are the, what are the hardest of things? Speak of your fears. Speak of your delights. You know, those are the questions that seem to be in the background of the Psalms. 
So it's, in, in some ways, the question is very, very simple. How are you? How are you? And, and it could be like a, like a dinner invitation where you have to ask it two or three times before somebody actually believes that you, you're interested in such things. How are you? How are you? Uh, man in, in, in church I've been praying for, he, his wife brings him. He doesn't have a profession of faith himself. Hey, how are you? What's happening? Uh, I'm going fishing. I'm going to be going on a fishing trip to California. Uh, uh, some of, there might be, I'm, I'm sure there are fisher, fisher people here, but I am not one of them. And so when somebody talks about fishing, I just sort of glaze over. And, and, uh, but part of knowing somebody is, you know, tell me a little bit more. Tell me a little bit more. And then he begins to talk about this fishing trip. Uh, but he's going to rendezvous with his son. And when he talks about his son... All of a sudden, you can see that, that you are reaching into this person's heart, where he's just opened his heart to you. He's just, it's not that fishing is his beloved. His son is his beloved. And see, it's, you're in. You're in just a little tiny bit. And, and next time you see him, what do you say? You say, I've been thinking about you. And I think, what a great time it must have been just hanging out there on the boat with you and your son, who you haven't seen for a year. Tell me all about it. It's, we're, looking for, we're, we're looking for skills that are really very ordinary that all of us can do, but it just so happens that the Spirit uses them to, to knit a body together and and to, give us, and, and to lead us in being able to care pastorally for each other. And, and our, our con- I, I saw him Sunday. Our conversations are different. I've been thinking, how's your son? Okay. Tell, you know, tell me, how are your other children? You've been talking about once. Tell me about your other children. And, and each time, each time we have a conversation, he's willing to share a little bit more about his heart. He's willing to share a little bit more about the hard things at work, not simply the, the superficial niceties. And, and I pray for him. How are you? I, the, the, the challenge here is it's not simply collecting data. It's, it's to be able to respond to, to that data at all. So, so in knowing someone, you, we, we understand that the word know in Scripture is this very full word. And, and it means that, that you are affected by what another person has said. You have, been, you have been moved by, by the things that, that they have said. You, you enjoy the things that they enjoy. You, you bear the burdens of the things that, that are hard for them. I often think of a situation when my wife was in where I, um, I was coming in the door one time and she was talking to somebody on the phone and and she said, oh, I'm so, so, oh, I'm so sorry. That, that's got to be so hard. I, what, what can I do? I, I know you're alone. And it turns out it was a woman from our church who, was, who had been sick for a couple of weeks. And, and as I heard my wife speak, as I heard one side of the conversation, I, I realized that that relationship has just changed. That, that my wife has reached in wanting to know this person and the other person has seen my wife be affected. And, and from that moment on, I watched my, that, that woman's relationship change with my wife, where she, she would ask for prayer, they would pray together. All, the, the depth of sharing was, it, it was unprecedented, simply because my wife said, how are you? And, and when this woman shared things that were difficult, my wife, my wife was moved by by what she said. The word personal in scriptures is, is a word I oftentimes think of. And, and, and to, to talk about a personal God is to identify the God who, when we speak, he listens and he's moved by what we say. Extraordinarily enough. And, and, and obviously he speaks to us and, and we are moved, we are somehow reshaped by what he says back and forth. We are, we are aiming to, to bring the same thing 
in our knowledge of another person. Moving toward each other. How are you? What are the things that are important for you? What are the things that, that are especially on your heart? This is, this is, this is, this is, we're doing theology. This is moving in to another person's life and, and knowing them. And, and, and imagine this. We know in the deeper recesses of the human heart would be, would be affections that guide us morally. And, and these things are not oftentimes given easily. Uh, the relationship has to have, have been tested in a sense. But imagine this. A person who, who knows that you care about what's important to them. How are you doing? How is your, how is your heart? How is your heart? I had a friend who asked me this particular question. And, and it was, it, it, doesn't it sound different than how are you? How are you? you talk about the, the issues of life. How is your heart? Somehow was asking, what is the moral vector of your life? And, and, and he was causing me to, to reflect further and he was asking for a different kind of openness. And I said, thank you so much for asking. I, here are some of the things I've been struggling with in my relationship with my wife, some of the sins that I've seen, of, uh, just, just, just my own sin of selfishness. I, I don't think that I am covering any sins up right now. I, I think I'm willing to speak about them. But I thank you so much for, for asking that particular question. How's your heart? In other words, what, how's the moral vector of, of your life? Is it, is it moving toward obedience or is it moving toward disobedience? Here again, we have the opportunity to, as we're moving into a person's heart and knowing them, to respond personally, to be moved by what they say. As, as, as we know people personally, we will see these, these, these amazing good things and we will see these struggles with sin. As, as we see amazing good things, for example, I, uh, another person in our church who, who's been, been laboring under all kinds of medical problems, how are you? How's your heart? Because it, it's asking something a little bit deeper. He says, I wake up and, and I feel like I want to die. And so I get into Scripture and I, I force feed, essentially. I'm, I don't feel hungry for Scripture, but I force myself to read it. Do you hear that, by the way? One of the benefits of personal ministry that we don't have in public ministry is we get to see the Spirit working in the details of somebody, somebody's life. So here you are knowing someone, and what you're knowing is, is, is a person turning to Christ in the midst of real difficult things. It makes you want to take your shoes off because you're in holy ground. And you end up saying thank you. And here's a man who talks, he says, for the next hour I'll get in Scripture until I finally get hungry, until, until I finally fix my eyes on Jesus, then I'm able to move out into my day. What do you say? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And could we pray together? Could, could, could I pray that you would have perseverance in such things? Could you pray that, that, that I would attain the kinds of things that the Spirit has done in your own life? It's simply being moved by, 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 by spiritual growth in another person. A person confesses pornography to you. What do you do? You're moved by it. It's, it it's, here's a person in danger. And when somebody is in danger, you're affected by it. And the question can be, all right, what can we do? What can we do together to put up a fight? You're, you're moved by what this person has said and, 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 and there's this humility and neediness where you don't, you're not coming out and with all the answers. You're, you're saying, Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy. And no doubt a person will, will speak more of the things in their heart after that. We're just talking about knowing another person. 
Obviously, at the very depths of the human heart are our spiritual allegiances, our affections toward Christ or away from Christ. And, 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 and there is no, in your knowledge of another person, there is no deeper place. There, there, there's nothing more profound in our lives. And I'm, I'm speaking doctrinally right now. What does it mean? It might mean, thank you so much for your willingness to, to say you're struggling with pornography. Lord, have mercy on us. And, and here's the mercy he's going to show us. Somehow we are going to grow in the knowledge of Christ. And in and, and knowing his love and loving him re, in return, in, in, in such a way that, 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 we, that we love self-control it is an expression of the gospel of grace, then we love indulging our own desires. I have no idea how that's going to happen. You see, what, what am I just trying to do? I'm trying to, I'm trying to say that, that this is the work of Christ, and, and we know where to point and who to point to. But we're looking for a, a ministry methodology that is available to everyone. And everyone can say, here's what we know, that somehow these things, these matters are resolved in the person of Jesus. And our job is to pray that we would know him and somehow see the Spirit making connections between pornography and the knowledge of Christ, addictions and the knowledge of Christ, depression and the knowledge of Christ, fears and in the knowledge of Christ. In order for a church to be mobilized in in the way they care for each other, there has to be this understanding of the human heart that that is is, is willing to ask, what is especially important to you? Tell me more. And oftentimes, simply thank you. When when you have been given access to those things that are important in another person's life, it's it's this great honor. And when you say thank you, that's part of being moved. In humility, we're willing to to speak about our own struggles and ask for prayer. We move toward others, and and we we want to somehow have them etched in our own hearts. Their joys, their pains, their struggles, their sins, things that are important to them. And, And then we pray. Imagine. Imagine... Imagine after a church service. I've seen this happen once. Imagine that, 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 you, that you look for somebody from the, from, from the church to speak with, and everybody's engaged. Everybody's engaged with each other. And, and, and you see these pockets of people praying through, throughout the church, people lingering because they love each other, and, and they're, they're knowing each other better. Imagine, imagine such a thing. This is, we live in an age where, I'm a, I'm a professional counselor, uh, and, and I'm, I don't want to demean professional counseling, but in the, because there's a place for experience and wisdom, for, you know, wisdom that comes from experience, but, but isn't it true that God seems to be especially pleased with, with ordinary ministry, ordinary love that we demonstrate toward each other is is the way he revolutionizes the the body of Christ. To know someone, how can we pray? In light of what you said, how can we pray? Uh, Could I pray for you right now? That's, those are the ingredients of ministry. And and, 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 and then then at the other bookend, to, to pursue again. We've pursued someone in order to know them and to pray with them and pray for them. But I can remember one time seeing a, a definition of the, of the word pastor. And, and, and it said this, a pastor is someone who, who, who accepts the long-term care of others' spiritual welfare. And it was the word long-term that, that, that actually struck me and, and, and rebuked me. I think counselors occasionally can be consultants. You... You dispense something and you move on to something else. And, but, but, but pastors have, they walk with people over a longer time. 
for, for a congregation to be mobilized in pastoral care, little p, pastoral care, it's, it's knowing and praying for. But, but if indeed a person is etched in our hearts, imagine, I've been thinking about you. Anybody ever said that? I'm sure they have. I've, I've been praying for you. I've been praying for this particular situation. I was teaching a class and I and, uh, had a grandson who was being hospitalized. And, and I, knew I, was, I, I knew it was going to be intrusive. And so and before the class started, I said, I'm going to have to pray because, because I, I'm, I'm going to be thinking about Jack, my, my, my grandson, and, and I, I want to be here with you. And so I, I prayed. And, and a month later, a month later, somebody from the class came up and and said, I've been praying for Jack. How is he? Have you ever had anything like that happen to you? <laughs> Where you've been on a, a person's heart for an entire month? Have, has, there been, has there been a tragedy in your own life? And, and a year later, somebody comes up and says, I, I think this is the time of year when you... When you lost this particular, when you lost your parent, do you, do you see how the body of Christ changes on that particular comment? It's what is it? It's simply that pastoral pursuit after having known you and prayed for you. If if we're praying somebody according to the promises of God, we and we love that person. There, there's an eagerness to to follow up. What is the Lord doing? What is the Spirit doing? To to enjoy the operations of the Spirit with, with the person. I invite you today to simply, to, for us to, to take that Ephesians 4 passage especially seriously, that, that our job is to, is to equip others to do the work of ministry. And, and God is pleased to, to use ordinary, weak, seemingly unimportant people to do the most extravagant things. Whatever, whatever the template you're going to have for your church, I, I, I suspect would at least have these particular ingredients. Humility. Pursuit. How are you? How are you? What are the things on your heart and to be moved by such things. How can we pray, given what you're saying? And, 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 and you, you can see it in, in each one of these little facets of ministry, there's, there's an entire lifetime of growth. How can we pray? Sometimes you have no idea how to pray. I have no idea how to pray, so let's just pray, Jesus, help us. And, and then... Which, could there be a better way to pray? And, and then you can say, you grab somebody in, in church and say, could you pray with us? We're, we're stymied on this. How, we don't even know how to pray. And, and all of a sudden you learn more of Scripture. Somebody links particular Scripture to, to how you pray. All of a sudden you find yourself, and this would be the most common way into a person's heart. They, they talk about physical dif difficulties they've been having. And could I pray for you? Could I... Can I pray for you that, that, that God would bring healing to your life with James 5 in mind? But, but could I also pray for you, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 16? Because here's what we know. The, the, the body, it, it, it wastes away. But in the midst of that, our inner person can be renewed day by day as as, as somehow physical disabilities become this occasion for us to see eternal matters a bit more vividly. Could I pray that for you? See, what is it? It's just, it's just, it's just us growing in how we pray for one another. Okay. You're sick. I'm going to pray for your healing. That, that, that's, that's wonderful, but, but there's more that you're going to find in Scripture. And, and then you can see that pastoral pursuit that follows. How are you? been praying for you. How is your heart? How is your body? We've been praying for your body to be strengthened, but I've especially been praying for your soul to be strengthened. And, and there are only two possible responses to that. One is, here's, here's how the Spirit has met me. Here's how Scripture has become, 
become more vivid in my own life. Or, frankly, I, I feel like God is distant and, and uninterested. I, my sense is that he hears nothing of what I say. Those are the two possibilities, and there, and there are certain things in between. But either way, what do you do? You, let me pray for you, brother. And, 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 if, and, and if it's the God is distant variety, let's, let's, let's have other people join us. It's, it, it, and this is the way ministry tends to happen, isn't it? We, we pray for each other. And as struggles continue, we, we enlarge the circle of the body of Christ. And in that larger circle, there are going to be more people praying. There's also different kinds of wisdom that is, that is brought to bear as we, as we care for this particular person. Could we, let me, let me ask this person to pray. And, oh, and by the way, here's a person who, who's gone through very similar things. Why don't, we, why don't we include him or her in this? You see, it's, what we're looking for is, our, is a strategy that is, it's really very simple, very accessible, uh, that, that any child would be able to do it. But again, it, it's in the Lord's inimitable way. He, he chooses weak people to do the most extraordinary things in, in our lives.